So today we will uh, discuss chronic kidney disease and mineral bone disorder and So today we will discuss uh, hyperkalemia approach and management. Uh, potassium metabolism, if we talk about, so there is cellular store of 3,300 milliequivalent of the potassium and muscle condition of 2,500 milliequivalent of the potassium. RBCs have 250 milliequivalent, liver has 250 milliequivalent and bone has 300 milliequivalent of the potassium. And because of ATP, A, ADP uh, synthetase, uh, some extracellular fluid uh, contains only 65 milliequivalent of the potassium and most of the potassium is in the inside the cell. So most of the uh, potassium is contained by the muscle 2650 millimole, liver contains 250 millimole, interstitial fluid 35 millimole, RBC is 35 millimole and plasma 15 millimole. And intracellular compartment of the body has 150 millimole and extracellular only has 4 millimole. So body retains potassium inside the cell. Now coming to the renal handling of the potassium. So as we see the diagram of the glomeruli and tubular interstitial compartment. So proximal cannulated tubule uh, reabsorbs around 75, 65 to 70% of the uh, sodium and uh, potassium. And the rest 35% is reabsorbed at the uh, early part of the loop of Henle. Then 50% at the uh, early ascending limb and early distal convoluted tubule, then 25% of the thick ascending limb, then at the distal convoluted tubule around 10 to 15% and then collecting duct. So fractional excretion of sodium is collect, uh, calculated by urinary potassium into serum creatinine divided by the serum potassium into urinary creatinine multiplied by 100. So if it is the value is uh, 10 to 20% or the 90 millimole per day, where the creatinine, creatinine, CR is creatinine and it is serum and urine values. So it is basically urine potassium into serum creatinine divided by the serum potassium into urine creatinine value. Now here we can see that uh, at the part of thick ascending limb because of sodium chloride potassium uh, ATP channel, uh, from the luminal compartment, sodium and chloride and potassium are transported to the uh, intracellular part of the thick ascending limb. Then, because of the sodium potassium ATPase, the potassium keeps inside and sodium uh, is uh, uh, shifted back to the blood. So, this type, this way, potassium is excreted through the thick ascending limb. Similarly, at the collecting tubule part, where principal cells takes part in mainly in the potassium uh, secretion. So sodium through sodium, sodium, sodium channel, sodium is uh, collected inside the cell and then with the sodium ATPase pump, a uh, sodium uh, gets into the blood and potassium is shifted back to cell and then at the luminal uh, compartment through the potassium channel with the help of aldosterone. Here again, collecting tubules to intercalated cells, uh, which uh, takes part in potassium reabsorption from the blood with the blood. Uh, uh, sodium potassium ATPase pump uh, works here and sodium gets back to the blood and potassium gets inside the cell and here again with the potassium hydrogen transporter uh, helps in uh, keeping the potassium inside the cell and uh, making hydrogen outside the uh, cellular compartment so uh, it helps in renal acidification and potassium is kept in the inside the cell. Here yeah, again, uh, as we talk about transtubular potassium gradient, so urine potassium into osmolality upon blood potassium into urine osmolality, it helps in calculation of the TTKG. If it is less than 3 to 4 in presence of hypokalemia, and if it is more than uh, 6 to 7, that is seen in hyperkalemia. In hypokalemic patient, a TTKG of less than 2 to 3, 
separates from the patient with redistributive hypokalemia from those with hypokalemia due to renal potassium wasting who will have TTKG value that is higher than 4. Again, transtubular potassium gradient, so TTKG value, based on the TTKG value, it has been divided in several parts. If it is 6 to 12, it is normal. If it is more than 10, it is normal aldosterone action and extradural cause of hyperkalemia. And if it is less than 5 to 7, suggest aldosterone deficiency or resistance. Then one test is being done by uh, 0.05 milligram 9 alpha fluorocortisol. So if it is more than 10, there is no change. Hypoaldosterone is unlikely. Suggest a renal tubular defect with either potassium sparing diuretic like amyloride, tramterine, spironolactone, or aldosterone resistance because of interstitial disease, sickle cell disease, urinary tract obstruction, pseudo hypoaldosteronism type 1, or increased distal potassium reabsorption known as pseudo hypoaldosteronism type 2, or maybe because of urinary tract obstruction. So coming to the epidemiology of hyperkalemia, it is usually defined as potassium level of more than 0.5 millimole per liter or higher, reported as in 1.1% to 10% of all hospitalized patients with approximately 1% of the patients uh, having significant hyperkalemia, that is value more than 6 millimole per liter. Prevalence of mild hyperkalemia, that is potassium more than 5.8 millimole per liter is approximately 1% in general medicine outpatient setting. Hyperkalemia has been associated with a higher mortality rate 14.3% to 41% accounts for the approximately one death per thousand patient in one case series in mid-1980. In most hospitalized patients, the pathophysiology of hyperkalemia is multifactorial with reduced renal function, medication, older age, more than 60 years, and hyperglycemia being the most common contributing factor. Now coming to those uh, patients with uh, CKD, in patients with ESRD, the prevalence is around 5 to 10%. Prevalence increases from 2 to 42 percent as GFR decreases from 60 to 90 to less than 20 milli ml per minute, 1.753 meter square in one study. Risk is associated with the more in male with CKD and propelled by the treatment with AS and ARBs. Contribution to 1.9 to 5 percent of death among patients with ESRD. Hyperkalemia is the reason for emergency hemodialysis in 24 percent of the patients with ESRD who are receiving hemodialysis. Renal failure is the most common cause of hyperkalemia diagnosed in the emergency department. So, another term is known as pseudo hyperkalemia. So, what is pseudo hyperkalemia? Forearm contraction, finch clear, first clinching, or tourniquet use may lead to false hyperkalemia. Some thrombocytosis, leukocytosis, erythrocytosis, that means WBC more than 70,000, platelet more than 6 lakhs, may also lead to pseudo hyperkalemia. Acute anxiety during very punctual, contamination with potassium DTA. Pneumatic tube transport was shown to have uh, pseudo hyperkalemia in a specimen from one patient with leukemia and massive leukocytosis. Cooling of blood prior to separation of cell from plasma, and then hereditary defect in rel cell transport. Now, coming to the causes of hyperkalemia, so as we already discussed, pseudo hyperkalemia may be because of cellular flux that is seen in thrombocytosis, erythrocytosis, leukocytosis, and in vitro hemolysis. Then, hereditary defect in red cell membrane transport. Intra to extracellular shift like acidosis, hypersmolality, radio contrast, hypertonic dextrose, mannitol, beta adrenergic antagonist, and non cardioselective digoxin and related glycosides, and hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, lysine arginine, and restrictive similar amino acids, succinylcholine, and rapid tumor lysis. And now, a few other causes like inhibition of the renin angiotation system, ACE inhibitor, ARVs, blockage of the mineral corticoid receptor like spironolactone, lactone, aplerinone, then blockage of the uh, ENA sodium channel, uh, amyloride, triantarine, trimethoprim, pentamidine, then decreased distal delivery that is seen in congestive heart failure, volume depletion, then few causes of hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism, that means renin is also low and aldosterone is also low. So that is seen in tubular interstitial disease, SLE, sickle cell anemia, obstructive neuropathy. Then also diabetes is very important cause. Then NSAIDs, both COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors, beta blockers, cyclosporin, tacrolimus. Then chronic kidney disease, aging patients. Pseudohypoaldosteronism type 2 that is defect in WNK1 or WNK4 channel. Then renal resistance to mineral corticoid seen in SLE, amyloidosis, sickle cell anemia, obstructive uropathy, and post-acute tubular necrosis. Then some hereditary causes like pseudohypoaldosteronism type 1 that is defect in uh, ENSE channel. Then advanced renal insufficiency like in stage renal disease, acute oliguric kidney injury. Then primary adrenal insufficiency that is like Addison disease, polyglobulin endocrine 
then HIV, cytomegalo virus, tuberculosis, disseminated fungal infection, then a myelodosis, malignancy, metastatic cancer, and few other drugs like heparin and adrenal hypoplastic congenita, congenital lipoid adrenal hyperplasia, and aldosterone synthase deficiency, then adrenal hemorrhage infarction, including antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Now, as we discussed medication, how they cause uh, this defect. So, uh, potassium containing medicine, so they may be because of increased potassium intake, KCL, polycitra, then beta adrenergic receptor, basically they inhibit renin. So, the examples are propranolol, metoprolol, etimolol, ACE inhibitor by inhibiting conversion from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, like captopril and lisinopril, then ARBs, they inhibit the activation of the AT1 receptor by angiotensin 2. Uh, examples are losartan, valsartan, lisartan, candesartan. Then heparin inhibits aldosterone synthase, rate limiting enzyme in the aldosterone synthesis. So uh, this way it causes hyperkalemia. Then aldosterone receptor antagonists, they block anti aldosterone receptor activation, like aspirolactone, aplerinone, then potassium sparing diuretics. So they block collecting duct apical sodium channel, decreasing gradient from potassium secretion, like amyloride, triamterene. Certain antibiotics like trimethoprene and pentamidine, then NSAIDs and COX2 inhibitors, they inhibit prostaglandin stimulation of the collecting duct and potassium secretion, so inhibit any release also, like uh, that is caused by ibuprofen. Then digital is uh, glycoside, so they inhibit sodium potassium ATPase form necessary for the uh, collecting duct potassium secretion. Then calcium inhibitor, they also inhibit sodium potassium ATPase at the collecting duct site, so uh, the examples are cyclosporine and tacrolimus. So the mechanism as the renin is inhibited by NSAIDs, COX2 inhibitor, then angiotensin uh, ACE2 uh, uh, ACE inhibitor inhibits ACE enzyme that inhibits in conversion from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. ARB acts as the level of angiotensin 2. Then spirolactone inhibits aldosterone and amyloride triamterine acts at the level of renal tubule. So in post-transplant patients like tacrolimus and cyclosporin, they cause hyporeninine type of help aldosteronism, and they inhibit the COX-2 enzyme at the macula densa, and NAK ATPase channel is inhibited, and potassium secretion is inhibited. So uh, similarly, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and ACRBs also cause hyperkalemia in transplant patients. So how to, uh, we should approach to the minimize the occurrence of hyperkalemia in response to medication. So we should calculate the GFR by MDRD equation, Cochrane Bot equation, and dietary supplement should be uh, allowed in less quantity. Low potassium containing diet should be given. Then we should avoid NSAIDs, COX2 inhibitor, potassium and diuretics in CKD patients. This uh, continue or initiate loop or thiazide diuretic because they helps in excretion of the potassium. Correct acidosis because it has been seen that with acidosis hyperkalemia is more commonly associated. So, soda by curve use can correct acidosis and hyperkalemia. And ACE and ARB and uh, Mendelner student corticoid receptor antagonists should be used only at the uh, early stages of the CKD and at the low dose only. Then, potassium level should be checked after initiation of the therapy, then every one week later. Then, if it is more than uh, 5.6, then ACE, ARBs or Mendelner corticoid receptor blockers should be stopped and they should be treated for hyperkalemia. If it is less than 5.6, Reduce the dose and reassess the possible contribution factor. If patient taking combination of ACRB or mineral corticoid receptor blocker, one should be stopped and potassium level should be rechecked. Combination of mineral corticoid receptor blocker with either ACE or ARB should not be prescribed to patient with advanced stage of the CKD. The doses of spirolactone with inhibitors should be not more than 25 mg per day. Now coming to clinical manifestation. So there may be muscle cramps, weakness, paralysis, drowsiness, low BP, ECG changes, dysarrhythmia, abdominal cramping, diarrhea, oliguria, and in the heart because of depolarization of the cardiac myocyte, reduction of membrane potential from minus 90 to minus 80. This brings the membrane potential closer to the threshold of the generation of an action potential. Associated cardiac arrhythmia, sinus bradycardia, arrest, idioventricular rhythm, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation, and AC stone uh, may occur and also cause. Brugada pattern in ECG with pseudo right bundle branch block with persistent coot ST segment elevation in at least two precordial lead if the potassium is more than seven. So these are ECG changes associated with different level of the potassium. We need to remember this and accordingly we can decide the alarming level of potassium and uh, further intervention can be planned.
So in muscle secondary hyperkalemic paralysis may be seen as we've seen with uh, familiar hyperkalemic periodic paralysis and in uh, renal uh, level because of a uh, significant effect in the ability to excrete urine because of interference of the ammonium excretion. Now coming to the management of the hyperkalemia. So uh, this is a flow chart of the potassium. So if the potassium is more than six, we should confirm with the ECG at the emergency department. And we find ECG changes then it is evident that it is a uh, significant hyperkalemia. So we should treat, we should take basic history, what drugs he has been taking, what other uh, medication is being given, whether he's following dietary advice or not. Then uh, look for the urinary potassium excretion. If it is less than 30 millimole, then it may be, then you should go for urinary electrolyte. That is uh, TTKG is calculated. If urine sodium is less than 25, so it may be because of distal, uh, decreased distal sodium delivery. If the TTKG is more than 8, maybe because of reduced tubular flow, then uh, it can be divided into two parts like advanced renal failure and reduced extracellular volume. If the TTKG is more than uh, less than 5, then it may be because of reduced distal potassium excretion. Then alpha fludrocortisone is given. And if it does not respond to alpha fludrocortisone, like if the TTKG remains less than 8, it means it is tubular resistance, so that can be seen with the several drugs like amyloride, trimethoprim, spinalactone, trimethoprim, calcium inhibitor, tubular interstitial disease, urinary tract obstruction, and if it responds with the alpha fluorocortisone, that it means uh, TTKG more than eight, it may be because of low aldosterone. Then we should go for renin level. If renin is high, that may be because of primary renin insufficiency or heparin, ACRVs, or ketoconazole. And if it is low, that is seen in diabetes mellitus, acute tubular nephritis, tubular interstitial nephritis, and sets and beta blockers. And if we uh, look at the other uh, side of it, so that if it is pseudo hyperkalemia, then no further action is needed. And if there is any uh, evidence of the transcellular shift, that means because of hypertonicity, hyperglycemia, and hydrogoxin beta blocker, we should also uh, take these into the consideration. Accordingly, we can uh, come to the diagnosis. Now coming to the treatment categories, so first the antagonism of the cardiac effect of hyperkalemia by calcium gluconate, then rapid redistribution of the potassium concentration by uh, putting it into inside the cell, then third part is removal of the potassium from the body, and fourth part is the treatment of the basic cause. So hyperkalemia and the diet, so dietary restriction is very important, usually less than 60 milliequivalent per day with emphasis on the potassium content of total parental nutrition solution and internal feeding product typically 25 to 50 millimole and adjust medication intravenous food accordingly. Hidden source of potassium such as intravenous antibiotic drug should be should not be overlooked. So potassium containing high condition uh, fluids, avocado, hamburger, milk, orange, potato, prunes, raisin, tomato, banana, these should be avoided. Then dietary potassium intake and mortality, it has been, few studies have been done. So this was done by Nuri et al. and published in American Journal of Kidney Disease. And the outcome was that if a high potassium intake was associated with increased death risk in long-term hydrogenolysis patient, even after adjustment of the serum potassium with dietary protein. So this again shows the dietary potassium and the survival in the CKD. So as the potassium content increases, the mortality increases. So this again showing the same thing. So now coming to the antagonism of the cardiac effect as we discussed with the calcium gluconate. So calcium raises the action potential threshold to a less negative value without changing the resting membrane potential, restoring the usual 15 millivolt difference between the resting and threshold potential and reduces myocardial excitability. So calcium chloride, each ml 10% solution contain 27.2 milligram elemental calcium and should be given through central line only. Then calcium gluconate, each ml of 10% solution contains 8.9 milligram of elemental calcium. Recommended dose is 10 ml of the 10% calcium gluconate that is 3 to 4 ml of calcium chloride infused over the period of 2 to 3 minutes under continuous ECG monitoring. Duration of action, so if the effusion in effect starts within 1 to 3 minutes and lasts for 30 to 60 minutes. The dose should be repeated if there is no change in ECG finding or ECG abnormality recurred after the initial improvement. So the patient taking digitalis because hypercalcemia potentiates the toxic effect of digitalis in the myocardium so that precaution should be kept in the mind. In this case, 10 ml of the 10% calcium gluconate should be added to 300 ml of the 5% dextrose in water and infused over 20 to 30 minutes to avoid hypercalcemia and to allow for an even distribution of calcium in the extracellular compartment. 
to prevent the precipitation of the calcium carbonate. Calcium should not be introduced in solution containing bicarbonate. Now coming to the redistribution of the potassium. So as we already know that insulin and glucose is the uh, typical treatment of choice. So 10 units of the regular insulin in 500 ml of 10% dextrose given over the period of 60 minutes. No further drop in potassium concentration after 90 minutes of the insulin infusion. And some boluses can also be given, particularly in the emergency situation where the 10 units of insulin is administered uh, by uh, in 50 ml of the 50% dextrose. So duration of action is within 10 to 20 minutes. The effect starts and peaks at 30 to 60 minutes and lasts for around 4 to 6 hours. In almost all patients, the plasma potassium drops by 0.5 to 1.2 millimole after this treatment. In hyperglycemic patients with glucose level 200 to 250 milligram per deciliter or more, insulin should be administered without glucose and with close monitoring of the plasma glucose. The dose can be repeated as necessary. Now coming to beta 2 adrenergic antagonist. So salbutamol similarly does same uh, like potassium shifting of the inside the cell, which is also very widely used. Recommended dose is 0.5 milligram of the albuterol in 100 ml of the 5% dextrose given over the period of 10 to 15 minutes. Its potassium lowering effect starts in few minutes maximum in 30 to 40 minutes and lasts for 2 to 6 hours. It reduces potassium uh, by uh, 0.9 to 1.4 millimole per liter. The recommended dose is 10 to 20 milligram of nebulized albuterol in 4 ml of the normal saline inhaled over the 10 minutes and its calipinic effect starts in about 30 minutes, reaches in peak in 90 minutes and lasts for 2 to 6 hours. And it uh, decreases potassium level by 0.5 to 1 millimole per liter. Albuterol and insulin with glucose have additive effect in reducing potassium level can decrease plasma potassium concentration approximately 1.2 to 1.5 millimole per in total. So treatment of albuterol may result in increase in plasma glucose level and is noted in the heart rate. The increase in heart rate may prone more to ones with IV form and less with the inhaled form. So it is prudent to use that these agents should be used with caution in ischemic heart disease. Now coming to sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate, especially large uh, single agent, has no role in continuity treatment of the acute hyperkalemia. Prolonged infusion of the sodium bicarbonate in SRD uh, reduces potassium concentration at 5 to 6 hours by up to 0.7 millimole per liter uh, and half effective to volume expansion. The infusion of the sodium bicarbonate may reduce serum ionized calcium level and cause volume overload. So issue of the relevance in renal dysfunction. So bicarbonate, epinephrine, insulin glucose and dialysis. This way, they decrease the potassium concentration over the period of uh, 60 minutes. So this way, uh, as we discussed, the calcium uh, does the antagonization of the membrane effect. It's insulin and beta 2 adrenergic basically act at the cellular level and potassium removal is done by polystyrene and hemodialysis. So diuretics is also useful in removal of the potassium in patients with impaired renal function. Oral diuretic with high bioavailability like torsamide uh, uh, should be used to minimize the chance of accumulation and toxicity. And short uh, acting agent with least hepatic metabolism should be uh, preferred like flusamide and combination of loop and thiazide diuretic for better effect and may decrease GFR due to activation of the tubular glomerular feedback. Use of maximum safety sealing dose is recommended. Then cation exchange resin, as we uh, already know that sodium poly polystyrene sulfonate with laxative is very useful in uh, removal of the potassium from the GI tract. The effect uh, is also slow. It may take 4 to 34 hours to find a significant effect on potassium level. Oral dose is 15 to 30 grams, which can be repeated every 4 to 6 hours. Each gram of resin binds to 0.5 to 1.2 milliequivalent of the potassium in exchange with 2 to 3 milliequivalent of the sodium. And similarly, we should restrict the dietary potassium. So it can be administered rectally also in retention anema in patient unable to take or tolerate oral form. 30 to 50 milliliter gram of the resin is used in 100 ml of the aqueous vehicle. It should be administered warm with clean anema with body temperature uh, tap water through a rubbed, uh, rubber power tube placed 20 centimeters from the rectum with the tip well into the sigmoid colon. The immersion should be introduced by gravity first with an addition of 50 to 100 ml of the non-sodium containing fluid retaining for at least 30 to 60 minutes, followed by cleansing anema. Especially in sorbitol should not be used given the risk of colonic necrosis. The risk of intestinal necrosis appears to be greatest uh, with SPS is given in sorbitol within the first week after surgery, it is of bowel obstruction, patient with slow intestinal transit and ischemic bowel disease and renal transplant recipient. So given these serious concerns, clinicians must carefully consider whether emergency treatment with SPS is actually necessary for the management of hyperkalemia or not. 
There are minimal data of the effect of SPS within the first 24 hours with after administration of for hyperkalemia. Best effect occur within the four to six hours of the administration. So other agents like lysinic acid and mineral corticoids can also be used. Dialysis is most uh, important and very effective treatment. So continuous hemodiafiltration increasing the use and management of the critically ill and hemodynamically unstable patient. We did not very effective in acute setting, but has been useful in cases of cardiac arrest, complicating acute hyperkalemia. PD is capable of removing significant amount of potassium like 5 millimole per hour or 240 millimole in 48 hour using two liter exchange with each exchange taking almost an hour. However, hemodialysis is preferred more when rapid correction of hyperkalemia is desired. An average three to five hour of hemodialysis session removes about 40 to 120 millimole of the potassium. 15% of the total potassium removal results from ultrafiltration with the remaining clearance from the dialysis. Of the total potassium removed, about 40% is from extracellular space and the remainder is from a intracellular space. Most patients, the greatest decline in potassium and the largest amount of potassium removal occurred during the first hour. The plasma potassium concentration is resisted by about three hours. Glucose free dialysate is more effective in removing potassium. Fit may be caused by alteration in endogenous insulin level with concomitant intracellular shift of potassium. The insulin level is 50% lower with glucose free dialysate is used. Further, these findings imply that potassium removal may be of greater if the dialysis is performed with the patient is in a fasting state. And treatment with beta 2 agonist also reduces the total potassium removal in about 40%. The change of pH during dialysis has been thought to have no significant effect on potassium removal. Given the risk of in the inducing arrhythmia with very low potassium, uh, the dialysate and alternative procedure approach has been proposed for the treatment of segment for hyperkalemia. In this regime, the dialysis is initiated with a 3 to 4 mL of the potassium bath, which will immediately lower the potassium concentration in a so slower and perhaps safer manner. The potassium concentration of the dialysate may then be lowered in a stepwise fashion with each subsequent hour of the dialysis. More sophisticated approach uses potassium profiling to maintain a constant potassium gradient during dialysis. Potassium profiling results in more sustained even, uh, removal of the potassium than dialysis using a fixed potassium bath, which has less effect on the wet clay ectopy. Now, com uh, coming to the causes of rebound increase in potassium. So, in case of massive release of the potassium from devastating tissue like tumor lysis syndrome, rhabdomyolysis, patient with high pre dialysis potassium concentration, pre treatment beta with beta 2 agonists, pre-treatment with insulin and glucose, food consumption early in the dialysis session, and high dialysate sodium concentration. Thank you.